Hi, so I wanted to take an opportunity to go through the process that we went through when we were designing Splash Mountain originally to just discuss some of the choices we made and uh, what worked and what uh, we hoped would work in the finished product. Uh, the ride's 27 years old right now, so it's very gratifying that it's still uh, chugging along. Uh, we're super excited that they're going to be giving it a new overlay. Uh, so we wanted a chance to talk about the choices we made with the structure and with the, the theming uh, in the attraction um, that exists at the moment. So up here on the left is Br'er Frog. Uh, he actually only exists in uh, Walt Disney World and in uh, Florida. And uh, he's an opportunity to do a last bit of storytelling to set you up for the adventure you're about to go on. Uh, and I think he's also an opportunity to remind you uh, to be safe and keep your hands and arms and feet and legs in the attraction at all times. We live he here and we make our way up to the lagoon in front of the mountain. And this area is very much like you see at Disneyland with one major exception and that is uh, the briars here on the right. At Disneyland, uh, these briars were originally created out of concrete, very much like the rockwork in the mountain, and they very quickly ha started having a problem with the water interacting with the steel that was inside of the briars. So we needed to come up with another solution, and Al Harias, who was the production designer on the project, uh, came up with this modular system. There are actually only five versions of the briar, and uh, he brought them on site and then arranged them uh, mounted him to the bottom of the lagoon uh, to give variety. So he really, he was sort of flower arranging the briars. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we were really consistent with the look of the briars. So they uh, appear throughout the attraction and they all look like they're coming from the same plant, basically. Uh, and that is all to Al's uh, focus and making sure that, that everything was consistent through the attraction. So here you see a little bit of John Gall's rock work uh, that's unique to Walt Disney World Splash Mountain. And the exterior of the mountain we knew was going to be sitting in Frontierland. So uh, this is definitely the domain of the humans. And everything is human scale, including this uh, structure here that we're going through. It's very much like the one at Disneyland. There's nothing in here that suggests Bear Rabbit or the other critters. It is purely a human environment. I believe Disneyland has an animatronic owl in here. Uh, we uh, ended up not having that in this space, um, and we spent a little of that money later on in the attraction. So we make our way up this lift, and then we're going to be in the upper loop, and this is a way to get us around and then back down into the attraction. Uh, this area is very, very narrow, and a good majority of the space is taken up with the egress path, the safety path on either side of the attraction. So it didn't leave a lot of room for theming. And also if these these rockwork walls weren't here, you'd pretty much be looking backstage and looking off uh, outside of the park. So we needed something to visually block your view that was attractive. And here's also the first opportunity we have of introducing the fact that there are uh, critters or animals that are living in Splash Mountain and around Splash Mountain. And so we have these little fun little static vignettes along the loop, including the Critter Elixir Wagon. And we also have this little garden that's starting to suggest that, that someone else is inhabiting this area beyond humans that live in Frontierland. And as we come around the corner, I don't think it's in the video, but immediately to your right is a little uh, still and some moonshine barrels and jugs. Immediately to the left, we'd be looking down into the where the train station is. Right here on the left, this tree uh, is actually designed by Chuck Ballou. Uh, Chuck later on went and became a senior art director at uh, Disney uh, for many years and has produced a ton of amazing attractions. At the time, he was working for the show set department, and uh, he and I have a very similar hand when it comes to line work. Um, so we gave him a bunch of things to work on that he was in charge of the design, and he did a really nice job on these 
these uh, little critter houses, some of which actually are holding speakers or uh, a lighting or uh, security cameras. Yeah, he did a really nice job here. And so as we turn the corner, there's a security camera uh, house. Immediately to the left is uh, the really only open view we have into the land and into the Magic Kingdom. And then we immediately tuck around the corner, get a glimpse of the drop right up there, and then we head over here. We can hear Br'er Rabbit's voice coming through here, and also we've included an homage to Disneyland's uh, bear country, uh, which used to have Rufus the bear snoring from inside a cave. They brought him back for Splash Mountain Disneyland, and we thought it was appropriate that we had him be here too, uh, here uh, at the top of the mountain. So we're about to approach the first drop, and we wanted to give you something to look at to sort of take your mind away from the fact that there is a drop, so we put this static little critter uh, suspension bridge with some broken boards that suggest that maybe some poor critter had a f uh, an unfortunate fate as he was walking across the bridge. And while you're looking up there, you're not necessarily looking at the drop, which starts to take us into the show building proper. So one of the big challenges at Splash Mountain, at least for us, was to see whether or not we could design an attraction that felt definitely like you were entering a cartoon. Uh, you were leaving Frontierland, the world of humans, and you were going into that sort of zippity-doo-dah, uh, super-saturated, technicolor, uh, colorful background, uh, and this is the threshold for that. So uh, we have a, a beehive that's buzzing away, which is sort of a hint, a foreshadowing of the beehives to come later on. And then as soon as we entered this sort of uh, first threshold, the color becomes really, really saturated, and we start making a transition into our, our co color cartoon environment. One of the big challenges we had, because our vehicle got so much wider and the flume got wider, and we still have the safety walkways on either side, we, we didn't have a whole lot of room for scenery. So a whole lot of what you see is very, very flat. Uh, there's not a lot of dimension. Wherever we could steal some for figures to sit on, we did, but most of the time it's rock work that dies right down into the water. And also we wanted to drive home that idea of you being inside of a cartoon world by allowing you to see some cartoon sky. And so wherever possible we have a psych uh, that's painted blue that's behind the edges of the rock work so that you can get the sense that you're in this very very saturated blue sky world with these uh, themed elements uh, in the foreground. Also, as you're moving through the attraction, we wanted that edge or those elements that were in the sets to point into the direction of where we want you to look next. So this is the end of that initial entry. So we see just an introduction to the saturated colors of the world. You start seeing a little bit of the characters. And then as you start turning the corner, you'll notice on the left, that the edge of the rock work is starting to dive into the next area we want you to look in, which is right here. And also even the rolling hills sort of cut into and dive and point towards the geese that are singing here on the right. Um, throughout the attraction, we're using thresholds as a way to tell you when you're leaving one scene and you're moving into the next scene. Sometimes it's very subtle and sometimes it's the, the transition is much uh, greater where the color palette will actually shift as you move from one area to the next. So these threshold acts, thresholds act as doorways. So as we turn the corner here, our first sort of threshold in the ride is this bridge, which acts as not only a doorway that's bringing you into the next scene, but it also is going to start helping as a frame for this moment where you're starting to see a lot more blue sky. You've got that multi-plane uh, depth of the various elements that are, is still extremely uh, uh, shallow. The, uh, those trees are just you know, semi-dimensional flats that are cut out 
and we've uh, reduced it as much as possible so that we can get a whole lot of blue sky to, to suggest this space is much bigger than it really is. All of your attention should be on the characters, but we use the sky as not only a backdrop, but also as this big sort of moving arrow that's going to help move your eye uh, across the scenery and eventually end where Br'er Rabbit is with uh, the bluebird. So we come around the corner, and the main focus is these two characters. It's, it's interesting, as a side note, you'll notice throughout the entire attraction that there's these, these little cut-out flowers. So in the model, uh, which was one inch uh, to the foot scale, uh, we were trying to figure out what we were going to make the flowers out of, and so we just took colored contact paper and a hole punch, and we punched out a whole bunch of multicolored uh, circles, and then we painted the ends of, of straight pins and then pushed them through the dots and then into the foam that represented uh, the landscape. And when it came to doing the show sit drawings and eventually doing the, uh, the flowers in the field, we so much liked the look of those little hole punch flowers that we didn't really change them that much. These are really sort of the same sort of dots uh, that appear in different colors. And then we have a, a, a rod with a little button of yellow color for the center, and then we just like pushing it into the, 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 the foam in the, uh, the show model, we actually came in and pushed it into the concrete. Uh, so wherever you see the flowers, they're all originally were hole punch construction paper. So in the background you see the first perspective, the trees get smaller, and also even the fence starts to, to disappear in perspective as we turn the corner and we see Br'er Rabbit and the Bluebird. Something that was super important to us was that not only did the briars look like the, they belonged to the same briars we saw in the front of the building, but we wanted the front of Br'er Rabbit's house to be memorable enough and graphic enough that when we see it at the end, we recognize it as the same place, which uh, was not necessarily something that we noticed at Disneyland. Um, we wanted to make sure to drive home that when he left home, he left home, and when he came back, he came back to the same place. So as we turn the corner here, one of the things you're not necessarily seeing is that immediately to your left, the barrier between the opening scene when you come in and this scene is really a sheer wall, which we've covered with rock work. Uh, it's, it's not very thick at all. Um, it is all painted, but we've done our best to make sure that we've lit vignettes that draw your attention away from areas that we didn't have enough depth to the theme. As much as we would have liked to completely surround you and show elements, uh, we found that the best way to draw your attention away from things that didn't have enough room for there to be theming on, that we would not light them, and also we would... Uh, just give it a, a dark paint color so that you could look at it and see that there was rock work, but your main focus should be these pools of light that take you from one vignette to the next. So it's worth mentioning that all of the staging for the characters came from Joel and Cicero's wonderful uh, sketches and storyboard images for uh, Tokyo uh, Dis uh, Tokyo Splash Mountain. Um, so the layouts are similar. Um, they placed them in different ways. They had a lot more room to work with and a lot more depth to work with. Uh, but we were able to, to retain a lot of the wonderful staging that Joe always brings to his work. Um, also, this is, as you're looking straight ahead, this is the last opportunity you have to really see an open piece of sky. We've got these two bunnies. One is sweeping the steps and the other is out working on the fields. The hill is not super effective, but it does give the illusion that there is more happening in the background. There's not a lot of depth here. It really is just a painted mural uh, that heads off into the distance. And once again, we're about to go through yet another threshold this one through a tree, and we end up in a much darker scene, which is starting to suggest that things are getting a little bit more ominous. We've got the fox and the bear, and then just to drive home, in case anybody's looking, we have a How to Catch a Rabbit uh, instruction book here on the ground, 
um, that wasn't at the Disneyland one. Just just in case you're you're in doubt as to what their motivation is. Um, and then once again, we've got this sort of vignetted light with the background, which doesn't have a lot of information. It's got a little bit of painting, a little bit of rock work, but most of your attention should be focused here on the scene and not in the background. So here on the left-hand side, we have the, the hopping rabbit. The hopping rabbit came in actually closer to the end of the design process, and uh, he ended up being very expensive, and there was some doubt as to whether or not he would uh, be effective. Um, he's not my favorite part of the ride. Uh, a, a lot of it is to, to make him function. There's a huge amount of machinery that's on the ground underneath that has to reset very, very quickly to get him in the starting position. And no matter what they did, um, the big armature that is uh, along his side um, that's hidden right now sort of in a green sleeve is really quite noticeable. I think if we had had an opportunity or won that battle, we would have gone for something that was more static. But uh, there was a desire to have something new in both the Tokyo versions and the Florida versions. So we ended up with this hopping rabbit. I have noticed in other ride through videos that he isn't always working. So here's probably my absolute favorite vignette moment. Uh, it's very much like Disneyland's, but uh, we've got uh, Br'er Frog again and uh, this wonderful layout. Um, and uh, this is one of the few places we actually have a little bit of depth so we can have this sort of inlet from in the swamp uh, where uh, they're fishing. Um, you also have a nice contrast of the, the, the blue psych that's behind it to give this suggestion that this is a, a swamp that is next to a much op more open area. Um, now this area beyond here is interesting because we really don't have any room at all for for much of anything. If you notice a, a, a large amount of this attraction, uh, especially along this area, is all safety walkway. It's on both sides, so if there's an, a need to ev evacuate, they can easily step out from one side to the other. So we end up with really just a long hallway. We also didn't have many figures for this space. We only have one, the Roadrunner. Um, everything else needed to sort of tell a story without there being really hardly anything. We've got the possums up above um, and the Roadrunner, but other than that, the rest of this is, is just theming to give you something to look at uh, while you're moving along quite a long expanse. So we wanted to see if we could capture all the various places and ways in which uh, critters might live in this environment. Completely not related in any way to the movie. So here we're actually coming along uh, yet another threshold. This is also telling you that you're about to leave uh, one area and move into another, a much darker area. And this is very much like the staging that Joe um, developed for uh, Tokyo, but we had even less space for this. So it got very dark and we ended up moving uh, Br'er Rabbit up above the drop. And so that we were really, really obvious, we, we made sure to write that this was the way to the laughing place in, in case you were uh, confused at all. And this is probably my favorite part of the attraction is this wonderful uh, in the dark dry dip drop which is great completely not themed at all because it doesn't need to be and then we move into this black light scene and once again like up above we focus a lot of attention on these lit vin vignette areas which allow us to not necessarily spend a lot of money and uh, and also uh, a lot of uh, theming on areas that you won't necessarily need to look at. So we've got Br'er Bear caught here, and then we disappear into the dark again, then our eyes are drawn to the next vignette here on the left. Everywhere else has some rock work and also has some of the roots and vines and briars from the rest of the attraction, but this area is mostly these uh, characters, and then there's a bunch of these 
sort of angry beehives that are spinning around um, over the top of the flume. Then we make a dark dive down into the laughing place. Now, the laughing place looks the way that it does, uh, really partially from Disneyland's depiction of it, which is subterranean, and then also Tokyo chose to make it subterranean. Uh, we made our subterranean because they made their subterranean. I think uh, if I had the chance to go back and, and rethink this area, I would have loved to have seen this also be an outdoor space or partially outdoor uh, I think one of the reasons that they chose underground and subterranean was because the ceiling is very low down here. And we just sort of wanted a lot of stuff to look at on either side. There's not a lot of figures here, um, so most of it's propping. What you can't see on the left is sort of a centerpiece that's a, it's sort of a geyser that's filled with pots and pans and kettles and water is squirting out of the various uh, orifices and pieces of that. It's meant to be a little light and then we get really ominous with the color as we move into the scarier scene where we see that Br'er Rabbit's been caught finally. Um, I have to admit that uh, that this is my homage to Alice in Wonderland. I, the attraction, I, I tend to uh, squeeze these in. I'm sort of embarrassed by it, but uh, this was the first attraction where I did that. And there's several of these sort of Alice signs that are helping you understand where you're going. In this case, Br'er Fox's lair. So more dark areas that you don't need to pay attention to, and then the main focal point, the vignette, are the vultures here at the top. As, uh, and we wanted there to be enough going on here because there is a chance that you were going to be sort of stuck down here waiting for your turn. And so it needed to have enough going on, enough dialogue to keep you interested. We make our way up. And then as we get towards the top, on the left-hand seat is a wonderful piece of shadow an uh, animation done by uh, uh, Disney Animation. Um, this scene is basically just a big projection surface and the props are meant to be there just to give it context, but not a lot of attention was made on uh, creating a space that was highly themed. It's all about this moment where you see the silhouette. And then up here we get just this wonderful, wonderful momentary view of the castle, which I think is probably the best view out of this attraction. And we make our way down the drop under the briars. So here we go. There's that walkway that goes out into the Rivers of America, that place where people can stand and wait and watch their family members come down the drop, and also a great place to take pictures of your relatives as they come down in the flume. So this turned out to be a really nice area. It's, it's the same size, as far as I know, as the loop at Disneyland, but uh, uh, a lot of that's hidden by uh, trees and uh, rock work. So this is much more open. And here we're making our way back into the show building for the finale. And you see there's some more of John Gold's uh, rocks with the holes in them. He really, really was trying to see if he could capture the feel of the mud banks and the rocks that are unique to the south. And as we turn this corner, we get the sort of establishing shot. Uh, and this is meant is to be the sort of final threshold, and it's meant to completely frame this like an illustration. So there is absolutely no doubt what's happening. We've got the welcome home Br'er Rabbit sign, uh, very visible. Uh, the area on the 
the right at Disneyland um, has animatronic figures, which we did not have. And so it needed to be there and have some information, but not necessarily draw your attention because we wanted your attention to go to the left as well as the center. You can see that um, even in these designs, the branch that awkwardly sticks off that tree is actually pointing towards the uh, showboat to lead your eye. And then on the left, we have Mark Davis's wonderful gators, gator band. Um, our showboat is actually animated, which I don't believe it is in the other parks. Uh, to do that, we ended up shrinking the showboat quite a bit. and um, giving it a little bit of a tunier uh, feel. If you look at the other parts, they're not necessarily as cartoony as they are here. More wonderful Mark Davis designs. And then we come around the corner, and once again, we wanted to make sure that, that there was no doubt that the briars that appear here are the same briars that appear at the front when you start. We also wanted to make sure you absolutely knew that bad things had happened to the to, to the villains, and the briars sort of lead your eye and point towards the very last scene over here, coming up ahead of us on the left, and that is that Br'er Rabbit is home, and the home should be the same home that he left at the beginning, although strangely and mysteriously his mailbox has switched sides, and that was mainly a staging. Uh, reason we couldn't seem to get uh, the uh, bluebird to work uh, where he, we weren't seeing his back instead of his front. So we sacrificed and moved the mailbox to the right. Then we pull back into the load, load, unload area. <laughs> 